Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a chronic lung disease of unknown cause. In this film, we want to tell you about the disease, its symptoms, diagnosis and treatment, and what you can do to maintain the best possible quality of life for yourself. Please note, this film is not intended to replace a personal consultation with your doctor. It's meant only to illustrate the information for you. With every breath, a healthy adult inhales about half a litre of air into the lungs. Every day, each person breathes some 10 to 20,000 litres of air in and out. About one-fifth of it is oxygen, a gas without which hardly a process in our bodies would work. In the lungs, the blood is enriched with oxygen, which it then supplies to the whole body. The heart continuously pumps used, oxygen-depleted blood to the lungs. At the same time, inhaled oxygen-rich air flows through the trachea and bronchi to the bronchioles until it finally reaches the air sacs. These air sacs, or alveoli, are surrounded by fine blood vessels called capillaries, which carry the blood flowing from the heart. The inhaled oxygen leaves the alveoli and passes into the blood. The oxygen-rich blood then returns to the heart and is pumped throughout the body. The alveoli and the capillaries are surrounded by interstitial tissue, consisting mostly of water and containing only a few cells. These cells, which are predominantly very elastic connective tissue cells, allow the lungs to expand considerably during breathing. In patients with pulmonary fibrosis, sooner or later there is a massive increase in the connective tissue fibres and cells in the interstitial tissue. In particular, the proportion of relatively inelastic collagen fibres is greatly increased. As a result, the lungs become stiff and the passage of oxygen from the air sacs into the bloodstream is severely hindered. We don't yet fully understand the processes in the body that are responsible for these changes. However, it's likely that pulmonary fibrosis is caused by injury to the cells lining the inside of the alveoli. These cells release chemical messengers to initiate repair mechanisms. The messengers attract certain connective tissue cells which produce the relatively inelastic collagen fibres that lead to the stiffening of the lungs. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a relatively rare disease. In the EU, an estimated 30 to 35,000 people are diagnosed with IPF every year. Men are affected more often than women. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can basically affect anyone. There are, however, certain risk factors that increase the likelihood of the disease. Many affected patients are or were smokers, have been severely exposed to environmental pollutants such as wood or metal dust, often have reflux disease, or have family members with the disease. The loss of elasticity of the lungs in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis often manifests itself in sudden shortness of breath during everyday activities and a dry cough that does not produce any mucus. As the disease progresses, the shortness of breath starts to occur at rest. Affected persons are often tired and may unintentionally lose weight. In addition, skin and mucous membranes may take on a bluish tinge and there may be widening and rounding of the fingertips, known as clubbing. Since the connective tissue remodeling of the lungs is not reversible, it is very important that the disease is diagnosed and treated at an early stage. Anyone with the first symptoms should visit their general practitioner 
who will refer them to a specialist or a centre specialising in lung diseases for further investigations. Before idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can be diagnosed, a variety of other diseases with similar symptoms have to be excluded. First of all, careful and searching questions may help to indicate the diagnosis. When listening to the lungs with a stethoscope as the patient breathes in, the doctor may hear a sound like slowly opening Velcro if pulmonary fibrosis is present. Lung function tests measure the lung volume, which is reduced in fibrosis. A blood gas analysis helps to confirm the diagnosis. The newly formed connective tissue may be visible on x-rays if the pulmonary fibrosis has been present for some time. Routine diagnostic procedures allow an initial differentiation from other commonly occurring diseases that have very similar symptoms to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and are more likely to be considered as diagnoses before IPF. COPD is a common lung disease with similar symptoms and signs. However, it is a chronic inflammatory disease of the airways which is caused by inhaled pollutants. To protect against these pollutants, the airways produce increased amounts of mucus, which binds the pollutants and is transported towards the throat, assisted by coughing. Mucus secretion with the cough is one of the most significant differences from pulmonary fibrosis with its dry cough. In addition, the tissues of the respiratory tract thicken in COPD, causing permanent narrowing of the airways. The result is difficulty in breathing. Asthma is an inflammatory disease of the airways caused by sensitivity to certain stimuli so that it occurs as intermittent attacks. The symptoms and signs of heart failure are very similar to those of lung diseases. This is one reason that lung diseases, such as IPF, are often diagnosed very late. Go to your doctors for a checkup if you notice any of these symptoms. If it is not treated in time, pulmonary fibrosis may also cause weakening of the right heart. Scarring of the lung tissue causes the pulmonary blood vessels to become narrower, increasing the blood pressure in the lungs and making the right side of the heart pump harder against increased resistance. The right ventricle, which pumps blood to the lungs, becomes increasingly overloaded and right heart failure may follow. The heart initially compensates for the weakness of the pump by beating faster. This may possibly lead to cardiac arrhythmias. If heart failure progresses, the blood backs up in the vessels before it reaches the right side of the heart. Optimal treatment of pulmonary fibrosis helps to prevent or reduce right heart failure. The heart failure itself may also need treatment. So it is essential to detect any heart failure associated with IPF. The first symptoms of pulmonary hypertension with right heart failure are also shortness of breath and rapidly becoming exhausted and there may be a noticeable bluish tinge to the skin. If you have any of these symptoms, get your GP to refer you to a cardiologist so that any heart failure can also be diagnosed and treated. An ultrasound scan will help your doctor to assess the structure and function of the heart muscle and also to diagnose pulmonary hypertension. Enlargement of the right heart can be detected on a chest X-ray. If there is a strong suspicion of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis after basic tests, more sophisticated examinations are performed at specialized centers. High-resolution computed tomography 
called HRCT, shows a lot of thin layers of the lung in such great detail that most patients with IPF can be identified. The doctors recognize fibrosis on these CT images based on four distinctive characteristics. If all four criteria are met, the diagnosis of IPF is confirmed and no further diagnostic procedures have to be performed. Otherwise, further investigation with an invasive procedure is necessary. Bronchoscopy consists of examining the bronchial system using a bronchoscope, an instrument consisting of a thin, flexible tube with a tiny camera at the end. During this examination, the doctor will also flush out cells from specific areas of the lung. This method of examination is called bronchoalveolar lavage, or BAL for short. Using a surgical instrument, the examiner takes tissue samples from the lungs. The specimens obtained by bronchoscopic lung biopsy and the samples from the bronchoalveolar lavage are then examined under the microscope. If bronchoscopy does not provide a clear diagnosis, it might then be necessary to obtain a small piece of lung tissue for examination under the microscope. These days, a surgical biopsy can almost always be done using gentle, video-assisted thoracoscopy. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis usually progresses relatively slowly, although sudden worsening, called acute exacerbation, may sometimes occur and adversely affect the course of disease. It is therefore particularly important to be treated at a centre specialising in lung diseases, where the necessary treatment steps can be started quickly. Drug therapy of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis aims to stop or slow down the lung tissue remodelling. There are now two medications available which can demonstrably slow down the progression of disease. Perfenidone and Nintedonib. The active substance, perfenidone, which has been approved in the EU for the treatment of mild to moderate pulmonary fibrosis since early 2011, reduces the proliferation of connective tissue cells. It is thought that most of its effect lies in the inhibition of specific chemical messengers that trigger connective tissue remodeling to scar tissue. Perfenidone is taken as a capsule with a little water at mealtimes. The dose is increased over several weeks from one capsule three times a day to three capsules three times a day. Skin reactions occur very often on treatment with perfenidone. Sunscreen should therefore be applied every day and sunbathing should be avoided. One of the most common adverse effects is nausea. Because it occurs less frequently in patients with a full stomach, the medicine should be taken during or after a meal. Laboratory tests to check liver function must be performed regularly during treatment, since studies have found an increase of liver enzymes in the blood of some patients. Nintedonib, approved in 2015, intervenes at another point in the body's natural processes. The connective tissue cells which cause the fibrosis are probably activated on their surface via certain target molecules, called receptors, that are sensitive to stimuli. Nintedonib blocks three different types of receptor at the same time preventing their activation and thus the production of scar tissue. Nintedonib is taken as one 150 mg capsule twice a day at mealtimes. If any side effects occur, your doctor may reduce the dose to one 100 mg capsule twice a day. Treatment with nintedonib very often causes mild to moderate diarrhea, which should be treated with adequate hydration and anti-diarrheal medicines as required. 
many patients experience mild to moderate nausea or gastrointestinal complaints. When taking this medicine, the patient's liver function tests should be monitored regularly. Some patients vomit or lose their appetite, which can lead to weight loss. If the oxygen content of your blood falls below a certain critical value, long-term oxygen therapy can increase your resilience so that you can cope better with your everyday life. For long-term oxygen therapy, there are hospital, portable and mobile devices. If the fibrosis severely limits lung function and medication no longer helps, a lung transplant may be required. There are, however, certain criteria that must be strictly met for this treatment option. One requirement is that patients can prove they have given up smoking for at least one year. In addition, their physical condition must allow such a major operation. It is therefore particularly important to maintain physical fitness as much as possible with oxygen therapy and rehabilitation measures. You can also do something that positively influences the course of your disease. Give up smoking and spend time in fresh air instead of in smoky rooms. Your GP may prescribe a pulmonary rehabilitation program which will help to improve your resilience. It's carried out as an inpatient in specialized centers or as an outpatient. You'll receive specific treatment from a qualified physiotherapist to reduce the rigidity of the chest and follow structured endurance, strength and breathing training. You should continue the exercises at home on a regular basis so that you can maintain the increased resilience for as long as possible. Nutritional advice will help you to achieve a normal body weight. In this way, you'll be protected from the unnecessary burden of being overweight and the susceptibility to infection that's common in underweight people. You will also come into consideration for a lung transplant. Be sure to get vaccinated regularly against pneumonia and influenza and avoid large crowds of people during the cold season.